Hey, Jennifer, can you hear us? Thank you. Speaker is muted.
uh, and yeah, there are many more people. And so, one thing that I see with her, I've seen more often, that immunocompromised, as you know, we used to use chemotherapy in the past. Now, we use immunocompromising agents from anything uh, rheumatoid diseases, Crohn's disease, uh, uh, allergies. So forth, and and some of those, as you know, work for a very long. Has to do with disruption of the gut flora. You know that CD biome. The biome has been a buzzword for getting that was ever proven to be the result of depleted and repaired. Diseases. I mean, people have ideas and theories about inflammatory bowel disease and, and research is going the depletion of perhaps PPI. How do we change the antibiotic? develop a UTI. These are typically bacteria. In infectious diseases, the rule is that the case with bacterial infection in carry. But most of the infections with bacteria you have carried. This is You have to be exposed to the reservoir to express with it, and, and of course, population it has been stable. People, the upper and low to lower middle income. And when you look at the spectrum, to be honest. Back to um, admissions, I didn't really find any data about admissions over time, but uh, I saw data from the COVID uh, 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 era, and uh, there's no question that uh, admissions for COVID increase with age, and with increasing age, we're just going to see more and more admissions. So, and I'm not going to talk much. The only reason I uh, included this slide is uh, to make a point that when we talk about therapy for CDF, one has to take into account the cost of CDF and not just the cost of acquisition of some antimicrobials to treat CDF. Because if you see more CDF, you're going to absorb the cost, and the cost is pretty immense. You know that many of the cases of CDF actually happen in people who are hospitalized, and it prolongs the hospitalization, and therefore it has a very, very high cost. And as you know, the epidemiology of CDF has changed pretty dramatically over the past uh, 20, 25 years, with the big outbreak in, uh, started in Quebec and a few points in the United States in the beginning of the 2000s, and this outbreak was still on here. Hello, hello. Testing, testing. You prefer me to use this one?
very much. Can people hear me now? Yes. OK, perfect. OK. All right. Thank you very much. All right, let me just find my presentation here. OK, I'm sorry for the uh, technical issues. Anyways, the epidemiology of CDF, as you know, has changed. We've seen the emergence of hypervirulent strains. These strains make more of the toxin, make more types of toxin. They are associated with higher recurrence. Uh, it really resulted in a in a crisis in, in, in Canada in the beginning of the 2000s um, uh, that, that included a political crisis as well because um, they were looking at their healthcare facilities and saying, uh, look at our aging healthcare facilities, multi-patient rooms and so forth, and this all fed the, the CDF outbreak together with the hypervirulent strains. And many of those hypervirulent strains are still with us and, and, and associated with worse outcomes and, and higher uh, recurrence rates. If you look at several studies that looked at treatment failure before and after the emergence of those hypervirulent strains where the arrow is, you can see that uh, both treatment failure as well as recurrence have increased pretty uh, dramatically uh, twice, uh, uh, sometimes even uh, more than twice, as high as, as they used to be. So CDF is kind of a dynamic uh, dynamic uh, infection. It's really funny because if you talk to people who practiced, uh, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, maybe we have a few in the room, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> Um, it, it's it, many of the many of the um, um, uh, uh, colitis uh, uh, episodes um, of kind of explosive diarrhea were caused by toxigenic staph aureus. And this toxigenic stuff really seems seem to uh, have disappeared, perhaps together with the scarlet fever strains of strep and, and, and a few other bacteria and, and been replaced by C. diff. And for a very long period of time, nothing really happened with C. diff until recently. <clears throat>
Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Sorry for that. So, uh, <clears throat> as you see, uh, there's been a lot of activity recently after many, many years without activity. Um, needless to say, one of the 1960s agents, metronidazole, uh, that we have used extensively for CDF and still being used extensively for CDF in some places has never been approved for CDF. And the reason it hasn't been approved for CDF was not just that there was no interest of any drug company, but actually there was no data to suggest that it's effective in CDF. The biggest study until a few years ago was 250 people randomized into 125 and 125 uh, and was not even a really experimental study. This is known as the ZAR study. And based on that, we have used metronidazole. So try to imagine for so many years, we have used an agent without data to support its use. So the first, the first line of, of therapy was, was an agent that was not approved. It was off-label use of an antibiotic, just to show you how much lack of interest there was in CDF. There's a lot of interest now in CDF, and I, I can tell you as a suffering, uh, miserable infectious disease doctor who is wishing to have more interventions developed to treat patients, that there isn't that much interest in developing other antibiotics for other indications as there is for CD for some one reason or another. So, so this, this is interesting. So a little bit of a uh, personal point. Uh, I, I'm sure you know the Oregon Trail with the pioneers moving to the west and, and crossing the Sierra Nevada and, and you know arriving at the promised land, also known as uh, the tax land of California. Um, we actually at Tufts had an inverse uh, Oregon Trail. We had 15 people who moved from UCLA in the seven, late 70s to Tufts, all of them from a lab uh, that was doing uh, anaerobic infections. And this brought a lot of anaerobic uh, expertise. And, and there were a lot of notable people in, in this group. John Bartlett, who passed away uh, recently and, and, and was the chief of medicine, uh, chief of infectious diseases at Johns Hopkins. Sherry Gorbach, who, who was at Tufts, and, and uh, Andy Anderdonk, uh, many others. And so, uh, <clears throat> and that's how uh, anaerobic uh, interest and, 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 and CDF interest has, has increased in, in, uh, at Tufts. By the way, we had some discussions, some people, I think, we, between us about uh, starting to do research at a relatively uh, late uh, age. Uh, when Fidaxo star uh, Fidaxomycin started to be evaluated, Sherry Gorbach came uh, at my office and basically told me, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to get into CDF and you have to do the fidaxomycin studies. And because he said that, you know, that's what I've done. And, and so that, that, that's what actually started my research activity uh, in CDF. So you can, you can always start the research uh, at any age and, and, and become an, an expert. <clears throat> so CDF, if you think about it, is, is a very, very interesting bacter bacterium. And, and, and so we'll, let's talk about it a little bit because a lot of what we do with CDF absolutely doesn't make sense uh, and perhaps is responsible for a lot of the consequences that we see. So as you know, CDF by itself is not known to be pathogenic. I, mean, I, I had a discussion with Anna yesterday about the patient uh, here who had CDF uh, isolated from a, a, a joint that appeared to be septic in someone with sarcoma and had exposure of the joint and so forth. And I said, oh, well, I, I'm not sure the CDF is the pathogen. The CDF could be just there. Some patients with CDF colitis have bacteremia. You can find a bacteria. But the bacterium itself is not known to be pathogenic. It's the toxins that the bacteria is producing. The toxins are not known to be virulent or causing disease, besides in the gastrointestinal tract where there is a receptor. And not everyone has a receptor for the toxins. For example, babies don't. So babies don't get CDF colitis. So... <clears throat> But you know that CDF is a toxin-mediated disease, and the CDF toxins destroy the colonic mucosa and, and causing severe diarrhea, sepsis, and death. Uh, yeah, as you know, bacteria in our gastrointestinal tract protect us from CDF, and we'll talk about that um, in, a, in a minute. But we've known that, that if you're not exposed to something that depletes bacteria, which is mostly antibiotics, sometimes some chemotherapeutic agents, you probably know that some chemotherapeutic agents are antimicrobials. Adriamycin, mycin, you know, it's and 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 quite a few others, and so um, and antibiotics kill the GI bacteria that we have and 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 expose us to CDF and make us basically vulnerable. Now, how do we treat CDF? Well, we treat it with an antibiotic, right? So, so try to imagine this is a, you have an antibiotic-related side effect, basically an antibiotic-related issue, and you and 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 use the antibiotic. It, it, it would be. Uh, to use the risk factor to treat the patient, right? And, and hoping for the best, hoping for the best. It would be almost like someone have smoked for many, many years 
and one bad day developed an acute MI and he's sitting there in the in the unit and you come to visit it's so you know restless and 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 concerned and and of course he is because he can't smoke in the unit you know it's just like take someone who's a smoker and don't allow them to smoke and you come and say well why won't you go to the balcony and smoke a few cigarettes you relax a little bit and you know what he will relax and maybe it will be good for him and as compared to the hundred thousand cigarettes that he smoked in his lifetime maybe a few additional ones are not going to make a difference but when we give an antibiotic like Vanco, metronidazole, which is a broad, it's a flora decimator. It's designed as a, you know, we use it mostly in intra-abdominal infections and aerobic infections. It's, 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 it's almost like injecting the cigarettes intravenously to this person because it doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. Now, why do we use antibiotics? Because if, if you have someone who's sick, you have to, you have to solve their issues. You have to take away their symptoms. And so we don't know another way to do that, but with antibiotics, but the future I don't think is going to be antibiotics. And I think that that's, that's important. So, <clears throat> so, so if you look at that, we treat C. diff with antibiotics, antibiotics deplete our gut flora, loss of biome leads to recurrent disease, then recurrent disease is, is treated with antibiotics and just fuels this, 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 uh, this vicious cycle, um, as I mentioned. So, Antibiotics that decimate the biome don't necessarily have to be just, um, you know, everyday antibiotics for pneumonia or, or, or UTI, you name it. It could be antibiotics for C. diff itself. And uh, we already mentioned metronidazole, but vancomycin, we consider vancomycin to be a rel relatively narrow spectrum antibiotic. It's a gram positive antibiotic. And so this is a study by Tom Louis uh, that was published a few years ago, looking at what happens to some of the normal flora considered to be very important and, um, kind of biome members after 10 days of vancomycin. Even more interestingly, how long does it take to restore them? And so what he found here, and, and the comparison was with fidaxomycin, but, but look at the gray columns. What he found was that after 10 days of vancomycin, you decimate about 50% of your clostridia that are part of your normal flora. Clostridium is a gram-positive antibiotic. So I said, well, gram-positive antibiotic, gram-positive bacteria, I'm sorry, um, is decimated. But if you look at the bacteroides and the pervotella, a lot of them get decimated as well. Now, bacteroides is a gram-negative bacteria. Vanco is a gram-positive antibiotic. But when you take oral vancomycin, the concentrations in the stool that you reach are so high that it has activity against gram-negatives as well. Even more interesting, if you ask how long does it take to restore it, you see with the clostridia, with the bacteroides, perhaps, perhaps 14 to 21 days. And the reason that's important is because this is the period of vulnerability. Once you restore your normal flora, you are no longer at high risk of C. diff. And so this is really interesting data. So uh, <clears throat> another interesting thing with C. diff is that, as you know, C. diff is an obligatory anaerobe, which means that it gets exposed to oxygen, it dies. And, and, and if that's the case, how can you actually transmit it? How can, how, can, how can it disseminate from one person to the other? Of course, the answer is that C. diff has two forms, and one of the forms is a spore form in which C. diff is producing this very hardy shell capsule in which it, it, it kind of isolates itself from, from the universe. And once in the spore, and you shed those pores through your gastrointestinal tract, those, those pores, as you know, are very hardy. They don't get... Uh, disinfected by uh, alcohol, by, by acidity, by most of the anti-septics um, that uh, we've been using, which is a major issue, by the way, when we care for those patients that I'll touch in a second. And, and so it, it is transmitted as a spore. But what we also know is that in the spore itself, the bacteria is isolated and cannot cause disease. And so in order to cause disease, the bacteria has to germinate out of the spore into a vegetative cell that is dividing, that is producing toxin that can harm the gastrointestinal tract. Now try to think about that. If the spore does not germinate in your gastrointestinal tract, it's going to be passed and no disease is going to happen. And if it's going to germinate before you ingest it, it's going to die of exposure to oxygen. So if you understand how, what triggers the germination of the spore, you can actually uh, use that to design an intervention uh, or inhibit um, germination. So I'll talk about that a little bit because I think it's it's pretty fascinating and all of the science has, has been developing in the past, I'd say about 10 years. 
Um, and and that's that's really interesting with with CDF. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, CDF uh, most people don't carry CDF, and um, um, uh, the rate of carriage is is really really low. Interestingly, infants are very likely to carry CDF, but extremely unlikely to get sick of CDF. Um, but if you look at people in the hospitals, and and there are very very few studies that were actually done systematically to ask what's the likelihood of people getting colonized in relationship to being in the hospital. Dale Gerding and Stu Johnson have done a study a few years ago. They showed that very unlikely at admission, but uh, by four weeks, about 50% 50, 50 of people in their study were colonized. Now, you know that if you use a test like PCR to diagnose CDF, and it's a test that does not distinguish between colonization and infection, you understand the likelihood of the test being positive regardless of whether the patient is sick or not. And as you know, we have been using, relying on PCR for quite a few years. Now we are kind of uh, improving our ways, but we have been relying, and that was part of the reason why we've seen such an increase. And when we stopped using PCR, that was part of the reason why we've seen this artificial decrease in cases um, that um, I'll talk about. Um, so what should we do after we see a patient with uh, CD? Should we, uh, you know, we, we are used to use the alcohol dispensers and, and we already know that alcohol doesn't make any difference. In fact, there were a few studies that asked the question, what happens to your hands after you see a patient with CDF and use the alcohol um, uh, rubbing, uh, you know, solutions or what have you. And what they showed is that after you see the patient, you have a few pockets of, uh, little pockets of CDF. And after you, you, uh, you use the alcohol, then it's uniformly uh, uh, covering all of your hands. And so this is not working. So what is working? Water is not working. Um, soap is not working. But the physical removal of the spores as you wash your hands with water uh, may be working. And so after you see a patient with CDF, you should be washing your hands with water and soap. And you should be doing that for a period of time that's adequate. Some people say 30 seconds. This is really not consistent with a busy doctor. I don't know who said that the 30 seconds. You know, someone is doing hospital epidemiology and stopped seeing patients. But, um, but one of the issues is that people with CDF are usually colonized with other antibiotic resistant bacteria because the risk factors for CDF are the same as the risk factors for ESBL producers and Candida and VRE and all of those. Those are best cleaned with the alcohol. So you have to use the alcohol and you have to wash your hands. Now, who's doing that after seeing a patient with CDF? I don't do that. And so, but, but the problem is that you see a patient with CDF and then you go um, and, and see the next patient. It is true that we put those patients on contact precautions if we know that they have CDF or suspect and, and, be, and, and, and they're being tested. But if we, if we don't, we basically move from one patient to the other without cleaning our hands. And that's part of the reason why CDF has been um, disseminating. And so, <clears throat> as I mentioned, understanding how germination happens uh, is a key factor in CDF, and I believe, um, and I'm very, very subjective in this uh, presentation, uh, I believe that this is going to be the future of CDF as well. I already mentioned to you that it doesn't make sense to treat an antibiotic-related uh, complication with antibiotics, and I think that this is this is the next step in CDF. And so I'll present to you some of the data, some of the work that was done mostly at Tufts. I won't present to you some other data and maybe sometime in the future, but kind of just to stimulate your, your curiosity. And, and so we already talked about the fact that, 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 that without germination, there's no disease, and germination is really a key factor. So the question is, what is, what is triggering germination? How does the spore know that it is safe to germinate? How does the spore know, know that it, it's, it's in the gastrointestinal environment and, and can germinate? And so apparently, <clears throat> There is a protein on the surface of the spore that's known as CSPC, and this CSPC is um, activated by, in this particular case, uh, tyrocholic acid. Tyrocholic acid is a bile acid, and we'll talk about bile acids in a second. And this activated uh, CSPC activates the germination-specific proteases. They basically hydrolyze the spore they hydrate and hydrolyze the spore, and then the vegetative cell comes out. So that's that's how it happens. If you look at um, at CSPC, it specifically binds thyrocholate. And if you if you if you mutate the uh, the, uh, the the CSPC so that it cannot bind thyrocholate, then you are going to block germination even when thyrocholate is 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 around, suggesting that 
probably there is no alternative path for germination. This is the required path for germination. So when you look at uh, a germination essay, by the way, germination germination essays are really hard. So again, if you want to get into research at a, a, an older age, you could do that without a problem. Germination essays are very easy. What you do is you take a growth, you take a medium, you you put spores in it, and when the spores germinate, the optic density of the solution of the suspension is, is changing. And you can actually titrate that to know how much germination, how, what percentage of the spores actually germinated. And if you look at this germination assay, when you add 1% of tyrocholate, um, the, uh, the, the, you get 100% of germinate. All the spores germinate. If you add 0.1% of tyrocholate, you get about 70% of germination. So you need somewhere between 0.1 and 1% in order to get um, perfect germination. If you don't add any bile acids, as in the bottom here, you get no germination at all. However, if you add the 0.1% tyrocholate, and together with that, you also put quinodeoxycholate, which is another bile acid, you block the germination and you don't get any germination. So now this is interesting because you have one bile acid that's causing germination, another bile acid that blocks germination. So, 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 so that's interesting. I'm not going to go through the biology of bile acids with you. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with that, but you know, the liver is producing bile acids. Before the liver is, is, is releasing the bile acids to go to the, gu the gallbladder, if you still have a gallbladder, they get conjugated, a, a side chain is being attached to the bile acids. As they go to the duodenum, the idea is that bile acids help, help you uh, um, kind of uh, um, um, <clears throat> dividing complex fats into fatty acids that can then be absorbed. And then those bile acids very, very quickly, and we call those bile acids primary bile acids, and very quickly many different bacteria remove the side chain so they deconjugate the bile acids. And then very, very few bacteria are capable of, uh, of bio uh, uh, transformation of the bile acids to secondary, sometimes ter uh, tertiary bile acids. So that's important to remember. So when you look at uh, <clears throat> when you look at uh, what happens, and without again getting into too many details, if you look at what happens in the gastrointestinal tract of mice, and now there is also data. It's not as graphically impressive, and so I've used the mice data, but there's data now from uh, humans showing this the exact same thing. If you look at mice that were not exposed to antibiotics, as uh, here in the bottom, you see a huge diversity of bile acids. Um, with very, very little primary bile acids because the primary bile acids get converted very quickly into secondary bile acids, deconjugated, and so forth. However, if you look at people who were treated with antibiotics, you see a huge amount of primary bile acids and very little uh, secondary and deconjugated bile acids. So bile acid metabolomics is very different between people with antibiotics and not. And, and the reason is when you treat people with antibiotics, you kill some of the bacteria that are responsible for the biotransformation. And, and without the biotransformation, you're just loaded with primary bile acids. So it works that primary bile acids are actually activation of uh, activating germination, while the rest of the bile acids actually inhibit germination. So if you've been exposed to antibiotic, you have a bile acid friendly environment for CD. But if you've not been exposed and you have normal flora, you actually have a bile acid inhibitory. So you say, well, so if this is the case, why should I care about the biome? I should care about the bile acids. It is so much easier to manipulate bile acids than to manipulate the biome. Who is developing C. diff? Those people with COPD who get antibiotics and then they get another antibiotic and another antibiotic. And you say, I'm going to give them a stool transplant or I'm going to give them one of the new, in but then what's going to happen the next time they get an antibiotic or recurrent UTIs in so many patients and so forth. And we said the population is aging. We're see going to see more of those people with recurrent infections. What with balance is all you have to do is, is just give them a small molecule and just bridge them every time they get antibiotics into normal flora, whether it takes two, three, four weeks and then, and then they'll, that's why I think that's the future. I'm very subjective because that has been also my field of work, but, but anyways. All right, so I think CDF is kind of more interesting than, and you know, it's amazing that we've been dealing with CDF for so long, but, but we haven't really figured out all those things until just the, the, the last few years. And, and you can ask me, if this is so straightforward, why, wouldn't, why don't we see more companies? So, you know, everyone is active with the biome and I think that there's just lag and, and it will come. All right, so a few things, I, I promise not to do too much when it comes to care, but a few things I think uh, are important. 
um, one of the things that we have changed with CDF is the way we test CDF. As you know, for many, many years, we, had a, we were detecting the toxin. We had an EIA or ELISA or what have you. And we asked the question, is there toxin A of, or B of CDF in the specimen? If the answer was yes, and the patient had enough diarrhea and, and, and symptoms, uh, which, which, which is required, by the way, then we'd say the patient has CDF. But the problem was, if, if, if the test was negative, we never knew whether it's falsely negative or, or, or truly negative, because we knew that the sensitivity of the, uh, of the toxin test is only 60, 70 percent. So we wanted to improve that. So we moved to a, a, a PCR. And I already showed you PCR does not differentiate colonization from infection. As a result, we identified a lot of cases they were colonized, but, 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 but not infected. We, you know, as a result, you have to treat them. You treat them, they are colonized with CDF. Now you're giving them an antibiotic. You actually increase their risk of developing CDF in the future. And of course, it was a big mess. And, and many have, <clears throat> many are still using PCR, by the way, but, but many have moved uh, to other ways. I know uh, at Moffitt, I know that, that, that you, do a, uh, you do a toxin. And, and, and uh, if it's negative, you may do a PCR or not based on. At Tufts, what we do, um, I think I have it. And I, I, you know, I made a list of all tests for you just because I know that someone is going to, uh, well, we talked about maybe putting it as a uh, podcast or whatever, and I wanted for completion, but I'm not going to go through all of the tests. Uh, most of those tests are not being used right now. Uh, <clears throat> but um, when we looked at, at Tufts, we used to have an algorithm in which we will do the uh, toxin as well as glutamate dehydrogenase test. And if the toxin was positive, obviously the test was positive. If the toxin was negative, but the GDH was positive, this was consistent with colonization, with, with having the bacterium. And whether the toxin was falsely negative or, or truly negative, we didn't know, so we, we would do a PCR. So we decided to compare those toxin negative, PCR positive with those who were toxin positive. And we found that these were two different uh, uh, patient groups. Uh, uh, <clears throat> For example, those who were negative on the toxin test but positive on PCR were far more likely to have alternative uh, reasons for diarrhea. They were on a bowel regimen. Do you have patients on bowel regimens? Do you have patients on bowel regimens who are being tested for it? So someone is being put on lactulose because they have severe diarrhea, and then they open up, and then they're being tested for CD because, you know, God knows. And so, <clears throat> and so um, we found that this patient group was very unlikely to have actually CD, and, and that's the reason why. We don't do that. What we do currently is um, uh, we do the, the toxin and GDH, but we don't reflex to PCR unless the physician asks specifically and has a good reason to reflex to PCR. And by that, we decreased our PC, uh, CDF levels. And I know that that has been the case here in this institution. We actually put together a pathway uh, for CDF. And, and the most important uh, first step of the pathway is actually who should be tested. Who should be tested? Because if, if, if you start testing people who should not be tested, you're going to produce a lot of CDF that does not exist. So, you know, you ha first of all, you have to have enough diarrhea. Secondly, you don't have to, you have to have no good explanation for the diarrhea. And I'm not saying that someone on lactulose cannot de develop CDF, but just the diarrhea being put on escalating lactulose without leukocytosis, without cramps, without a few of the other symptoms, is very unlikely to be CDF. And so, and if you'd like, I'll be happy to share this with you. And anyways, <clears throat> kind of, uh, we don't have much time. So kind of for the end, some of the challenges that we um, still face with CDF. So, you know, the first uh, challenge is you have someone who's sick, you need to treat them. And so you have to resolve their symptoms. You have to prevent them from dying where we have done very little, actually. As you may know, all of the studies, and I showed you how many drugs in development there are and so forth, all of the studies that we do with CDF, we, we purposely and intentionally um, exclude people who are very sick. Because the FDA tells us, that, and that's, by the way, not just for CDF. If you look at community-acquired pneumonia, ventilator-associated pneumonia, what have you, they do not allow, the FDA does not allow you to uh, include patients who are terribly sick. Because the FDA says, listen, this is experimental therapy. That's why you do the study. You cannot experiment on people who are that sick. You have to give them something that you know is working which, you know, you can understand, but then you ask the question, how do I know how to treat people who are really sick? I mean, these are the people who really need information. The FDA, I think, to my opinion, should have said, well, if it's going to be successful in the phase three study and we're going to approve it, it's mandatory for you to do a smaller study in very sick patients and show how it works because otherwise no one, but it doesn't happen. And because of that, 
the most uh, vulnerable patients in infectious disease with diff with we we um, yeah, you look at C diff. Yeah, it's, if it's someone with fulminant C diff, you give uh, um, IV flagell and PO vanc. Show me the data. Show me the data that they actually do well. Show me the show me a clinical one clinical trial in which this patient population was compared to something else. There isn't. It, it's based on some logic, and you know logic. Um, um, yeah, well, I won't get into this. Anyways, <clears throat> it has a very a short uh, span of, 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 of being actually reality. And then the third is to prevent recurrence. So uh, when it comes to cure rates, um, I can tell you oral vancomycin is producing about 90% cure rates and nothing is much better than oral vancomycin. I doubt anything is going to be better than vancomycin because uh, just from a trial perspective, to design a trial in which you're going to increase the effectiveness from 90 to 93 percent, and it's going to be statistically significant, it, it needs to have 2,000, 3,000 patients. And some people here can tell you how hard it is sometimes to enroll just a few hundred people with CDF. And so I don't, I don't really foresee that happening, and I don't, I don't think we are going to have something that's better than Vanco in terms of inducing uh, uh, remission. Uh, why not metronidazole? I, I'll just touch it very uh, uh, kind of quickly. You know that metronidazole has been the first line for many years. Now the guidelines do not recommend metronidazole yet. Many people still use metronidazole out of the country for sure because it's very, very cheap. It's very uh, low cost to acquire. Uh, one of the reasons to uh, not using metronidazole was actually a very interesting study. It was done by Genzyme. Genzyme is a company very close to where I live in Boston. They uh, have developed a toxin binder. They said, well, if this is a toxin-mediated disease, why should we treat it with antibiotics? We'll just take the toxin away. They developed a Lovimar um, and uh, compared it to Vanco and metronidazole. So this was a phase three study that had three arms, and this was the first ever study to adequately compare Vanco to metronidazole. What have we uh, discovered? That metronidazole, not only that it's not as good as Vanco for moderate and severe CD, if that we had high suspicions before, and even the guidelines said, maybe don't use it in severe disease, but even for mild disease, it was not doing very well. Not to mention the fact that it's a broad spectrum antibiotic and recurrence rates are high and also resistance is increasing to metronidazole. By the way, one of the things that were really interesting in this, as you see, telovimar, uh, completely failed. I mean, when it came to curate, it failed. That's why you never heard about that and it was taken away. However, if you looked at the second step of the study, looking at recurrence, those people who were treated successful with telovimer didn't have any recurrence. So interesting and probably suggesting that it is the antibiotic that you use to treat the CDF that is producing a lot of the recurrence that, that you're seeing later on. And so the current guidelines, without getting into details, are not recommending um, uh, <clears throat> metronidazole, but vanco and fidaxomycin is as first line for both uh, non-severe and severe episode and for fulminant, we haven't really made any progress uh, at all. Second question is prevent, how do you prevent death from CD? So you have one of those patients who, who presented too late, who are very vulnerable, who are progressing despite of maximal therapy. What are you going to do with those patients? As you know, colectomies has been um, the, the only way to, to approach those patients. And, and, and if your hospital is, is the same as Tufts, then you call the surgeon and the surgeon looks at the patient and says, well, you know, he's sick, but not sick enough for me to remove the entire colon. And then you call him the next day and says, yes, he's sicker, but still. And then you call him the next day and say, well, he's so sick, you know, he's going to, he's going to die. And so, because no one wants to remove the colon proactively, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, um, and, and so apparently there is a, um, there's an alternative to that. And what you could do is you could take the patient into the operating room uh, you could um, you could uh, bring a uh, an ileal loop. You can uh, wash the uh, colon with uh, ethylene glycol, also known as Golightly, that some of us know and many of you do not, by to judge by your ages. Uh, and then um, and then you you send them to to the ward and and you keep washing with vancomycin. And some of the the data on this procedure uh, suggested that it, it should be just as good as colectomy with lower mortality rate. The mortality rate in, in when colectomy is done urgently in the fulminant CDF is, 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 uh, is almost 50%. And so, so you look at the 50% that you, you saved as compared to everyone dying with CDF, but, but it's almost 50%. And also it's not irreversible. You know, once the patient gets better, um, um, 
uh, you can you can close this uh, loopy leostomy and and um, and the patient is fine. And so and so consider that some hospitals consider that on a on a routine basis. Some hospitals the the surgeons are just not not familiar enough with this. And also surgeons are more, much more likely to bring someone to the operating room early. Even if they're not terribly sick, if they know that the procedure is not major surgery, but but rather laparoscopic, usually laparoscopic uh, and and not irreversible. And then the third thing, which is most exciting, is preventing recurrence. And almost all of the activity in the CDF development, drug development, is uh, looking at recurrence and trying to uh, prevent recurrence. As you know, some of the risk factors for recurrence include a history of uh, CDF, which is probably the strongest risk factor. Age is a risk for advanced age. Concomitant antibiotics, you would be surprised how often people are being treated for C. diff, yet they continue to receive the antibiotic that because, because they have to run a 10-day course or, tw or two-week course or whatever. And when you continue the offending antibiotic, the patient is more likely to have recurrence. Kidney dysfunction, I think, pretty convincingly, we have done quite a few studies on that, are, is a risk factor for recurrence. Low toxin, um, uh, antibody for the toxin, and, and PPIs which are a risk factor for C. diff, may be a risk factor for recurrence. In general, one in five, one in four, one in six develop recurrence. But once you develop recurrence, you are, your risk of recur additional recurrence is increasing to maybe 30 40%. Once you had two recurrences, you're more likely to have more recurrences than not. And it's very hard to stop this cycle of events. And so very often when people ask, what's the best way to prevent recurrence? The best way to prevent recurrence is to, pre to, to prevent the, the first recurrence because once someone had recurrences, uh, uh, it, it's much, much, much harder. And the reason I say that is because you'll see that a lot of the interventions that come to the market are a little more costly and are going to be geared towards people who are already in this vicious cycle. Well, they could be used earlier to prevent someone from getting into the vicious cycle. And I think that that's part of what's going to happen in the future. In the future. Fidaxomycin, uh, which I was very involved in its uh, development, I'm not going to uh, discuss too much. I I'll just share some of the data uh, with you. I, I, I could, I mean, if we had another hour, you know, sometimes with drug development, the gossip and the backstories are more interesting than, than actually the data, uh, but uh, next time maybe. But um, it, 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 the idea with Fidaxomycin was that it was a very narrow spectrum antibiotic with great activity against CD. And so the idea was that we are going to treat C. diff without interfering with the ability of the gut flora to restore itself while you treat the patient, so that by the end of therapy, the patient will be much better positioned to not have a recurrence, have a better uh, uh, flora. As you see here, um, the clinical response rate was almost like 90% as PO Vanco. And response rates in clinical trials are always lower than in, in real world. So in real world, it's probably higher than that for Vanco and, and Fidaxomycin. But if you looked at sustained response, which means you were cured and didn't have a recurrence, it was half of that of Vanco. The recurrence rate for Vanco was 25%. The recurrence rate for Fidaxo was about 12, 13%. And so it was much better because of that, it was superior. Unfortunately, it's not being used as, as it should be used. And it really has no, it, it really has no disadvantages compared to Vanco besides the cost, besides the cost. And, and it, 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 it wasn't really used and hasn't been used to its uh, full potential. Soon it will become, it was approved in 2012, so soon it will become generic, and I think everything is going to be fidaxomycin. Um, and I, I won't tell you what I think about this, uh, but uh, I, I'm not sure when we don't use fidaxomycin for patients who are at risk of recurrence, I'm not sure that we do the right thing. Um, um, uh, and, and, and I showed you the cost of CDF. And I think that if you take the grand scheme of costs that are associated with CD, if you could easily justify the cost of Fidaxomycin. When it's outpatient, there's no question, but even when it's uh, inpatient. Um, even more interesting about Fidaxomycin, I, I showed you the data that it reduced the recurrence from 25 to, uh, to 12 and half percent, but then there was a more recent study that no, is known as the extent study, which is, was using Fidaxomycin the way I've been using Fidaxomycin since the very beginning. Uh, in a taper type of uh, uh, way. And so in the extent study, they took the 20 pills. So fidaxomycin is approved as 10 days, twice a day, so 20 pills. So what they say, let's do something else with the 20 pills. For five days, let's treat the patient twice a day. So we, uh, uh, we use 10 of the pills, and then the other 10 we'll use every other day. Because if it doesn't interfere, interfere with the restoration of the gut flora, and I already showed you that it takes more than 10 days 
to restore the gut flora, you're going to bridge people better into normal flora. And the result of the extent study, without getting into details, is that the recurrence rate was much, much, much lower. It was just a few percents. So if you want to use fidaxomycin the better way, even though that's not the way it's indicated here in America, you should use it um, twice a day uh, in the extent study until the uh, for five days. I typically do that until the diarrhea is much better, which is usually three or four days. And then you can use the rest of the pills. So it's not more costly because you're using the exact same number of pills, but use them in a much better way. Um, another thing that we had approved is bezlotoximab, uh, which is this infusion of, and there's a great story around it, but you really will have to invite me again because it's, I, I, we, we don't have time. Um, so I'll, I'll skip that uh, <clears throat> and skip that um, and just talk a little bit about the future for a minute. Uh, the future for CD, first of all, is even more neurospectrum and targeted antibiotics. Several antibiotics have been evaluated, including an antibiotic by a British company called Summit. They all failed. And, and I don't know if anything is going to replace fidaxomycin anytime soon. Another way is immune uh, manipulations. If it's all about the toxin and the toxin is a peptide, why not having a, a, an anti-peptide uh, vaccine? Um, and so both Sanofi and Pfizer are trying to develop a vaccine with a lot of setbacks, um, but hopefully we will have a vaccine. Uh, another way was passive immunity, just developing a monoclonal antibody as bezlotoximab has, be, has been uh, with some um, ability to prevent recurrence. Mi microbiome manipulations, we talked about that. Fecal transplants, as you know, are an issue, and um, um, maybe I'll show you one thing related to that. Um, uh, but, but very soon we are going to have all those important bio members put in a capsule. We already had approved just a few weeks ago, a preparation for colonoscopy that replaces the fecal transplant. So fecal transplants as effective as they are, I think will this completely disappear, um, and replace. But as you know, I think that metabolomic and metabolome man manipulations are the future. I think that it, they make the most sense They are, They will be cheap, I think. Um, and the only question is, are they going to just work well enough? Uh, uh, stool transplant, just to, uh, to remind you, maybe stinkier than you, you assumed. Uh, you know, we always uh, talk about, you know, it, first of all, during COVID, you know, we didn't have stool transplants because we know that COVID actually is very densely populating the gastrointestinal tract and we didn't want to. So then all of a sudden you do stool transplants, but the Massachusetts uh, stool bank is providing them anymore and then and you don't you don't want to it's 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 a problem to take them with other so all of a sudden you don't have those stool transplants uh <clears throat> so we check hiv and we check hepatitis b and all of that but you know there's tons of data that if you manipulate this stool you can actually make people who are insulin resistant less insulin resistant uh, and all of those things and so that's really great if you take stool from a non-insulin resistant i'm insulin resistant you make me non-insulin resistant but what, what if it's the opposite what if it's the opposite? What, what, what if there is something in a biome that's associated with colon cancer, that's associated with something with, with, with a risk, and we just give, we have no idea when we screen the stool transplant. So I think they will disappear. So for your podcast, I made three tables for current interventions and interventions that failed and future interventions. There are quite a few future interventions, so there's a good reason to be optimistic, I think. So to summarize, uh, thanks for bearing with me through the technical <laughs> issues. And uh, <clears throat> I think CDF is important. I think I think CDF is infecting a lot of vulnerable patients. I think that it's going to be even more important in the future. I think CDF is uh, perceived as something we can prevent. And when someone pre pre perceives that, even if it's not completely true, we're going to get penalized for having CDF and we can't really, uh, um, um, uh, you know, bird those penalties. Uh, I think it's all about recurrence, as I mentioned. Not much is being done to treat those very, very sick patients. And I think that we're going to have much better ways to treat it and, and prevent its recurrence. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, so the question was, can you define recurrence, Dave? Um, I don't know what stands behind the question, but maybe what stands behind the question is, can you separate relapsing CD from recurrent CD or reinfection from a previous infection that, uh, and I think that, um, um, I think that um, 
I think that most recurrences that we see happen very soon after you stop therapy for CDF, and I think these are pretty clearly uh, uh, relapses. So, so for the purpose of this study, relapse and recurrence, I, I, you know, I, I mostly talked about relapse, even though I called it recurrence. Um, and the reason I think it, there are relapses is because we know that by the end of successful course of therapy for CDF, people remain colonized with tons of spores, because antibiotics have absolutely no activity against spores. They remain uh, colonized with spores, and if their gut flora is still lacking, then they're lucky to not have a recurrence. Now, when does reinfection become an issue? I think that that's a great question. I don't have an answer. I mean, you could you could do typing on the on the spore, but if someone is in an environment where there are a few dominant strains and they have this strain and then they have the strain again, it can be a reinfection, and you don't even you you won't be able, even able to to tell that. But because of that, I'm in a minority that thinks that everything that you look at to prevent recurrent or relapsing CDF, you should look at for just one month of follow up and not longer than that. Currently, the, the, the standard has become three. For Fidaxomycin was one month, now it's three months and six months. And I think with three months and six months, you start to look at a lot of reinfections because people's risk factor for CDF don't go away. If you have recurrent UTIs, you continue to have recurrent UTIs, you continue to get. So that's the best I can. I think that um, if you had CDF and you have a lot of spores and then you have the chance to restore your gut flora and you were lucky enough not to have another episode, once you restored your gut flora, anything that happens later, I think, should be considered to be a new episode of CDF. Yeah. We only did 30 days for Fidaxo. We did 90 days for Bezotoxima. But, but anyways, we were criticized for the 30. But try to imagine you were looking at 10 years. No 30 days, 10 years. And then there's no difference whatsoever between between the treatments. So the time horizon for the clinical trials is extremely important. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm I'm from Tufts. You know, it's like your own football team. You know, it's like I I, I only know to say one thing. You know, it's it was published from Tufts, and uh, it's uh, no, I don't know. I mean, so there were several. It's almost like the HIV. We talked. Oh, I talked with Christian yesterday about uh, Robert Gallo and, and and Institute Pasteur. So there were a few publications about pseudo. So pseudomembranous colitis was known as an entity. But it was not clear what's causing pseudomembranous colitis. And there were two publications more or less at the same time. One came from Tufts, and I, of course, in a biased way, only, only showed this one. But there, there were others. Uh, there are a lot of crazy people with, well, not crazy people, people with crazy ideas in Australia. I mean, in Australia, there's a guy who's, um, and he is convinced that a lot of the CDF is imported from Australia, uh, to Australia, from California, because most of Australia is getting all their onion from one onion farm in, in, in California. So, you know, people have a lot of, yeah. You know, and, and, and you know, again, if you use um, a, an unapproved antibiotic as your first line for an infection, you understand that there's a lot of, um, you know, we have used, I mean, I can't tell you how many years and still many people are using probiotics for CDF to prevent CDF recurrence, yet those probiotics don't work. You know, whether it's Saccharomyces cerevisiae, you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae was worked because it was shown that it has a toxin-producing De uh, decreasing effect on some strains, but those strains are not 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 prevalent anymore. But people are still using Saccharomyces, and they use and it's it's kind of a uh, so so much of what we do in CDF in infectious diseases, I would argue, but in CDF is just uh, not evidence based at all. Yes, please.
Yeah, I don't know that I, I don't know that I, you know, so this was never really characterized very well. So um, I, it's a very good idea. I don't know. First of all, I don't think, I mean, from what I know, the receptor is not specific to CDF, CDF toxins. Um, and, and the lack of receptor in neonates is part of the prematurity of their gut in general. Um, but so I, I, you know, and I don't know if anyone who tried to manipulate the receptor, by the way, uh, in one way or another. Uh, but it's a very good idea. Yeah. Yes, please. Oh, thanks. Right. Well, so not specific to CDF, but I think that this is one of the future directions to treating infectious diseases in general. Um, so those immunomodulators. So, you know, so in cancer, we now do CAR T and, you know, there will be other things. And basically what we do is we take T cells and make them angry at something that we are interested in and, and then bring them back. And it's very costly. Uh, but if you can make T cells angry about microbes, uh, uh, you know, you can use them uh, for treatment. You know, obviously they need to be safe. And um, there are several, I mean, there are several companies that are looking at uh, broad spectrum immune modulators. Now, whether they're going to affect CDF as well, I don't know. Um, you know, it's very hard to measure cellular uh, immunity. And because of that, we just tend to ignore it because what, what is hard, we just ignore. Uh, with, you know, with CMV, you know, we've been struggling with that for a very long period of time, trying to determine who's at really high risk and who's at lower risk. And, and there are different, um, with CDF, uh, there's actually some, uh, some data suggesting that if you mount a lower antibody response against the toxin, your likelihood of recurrence is higher. And this was the basis for bezlotoximab, actually. Uh, but with cellular immunity, there's far less data. I'm sure that this is going to be one of the directions for the future, uh, and, and that, that, that they're going to kind of go across different pathogens. Oh, wow. All right. So, <laughs> so the question was, if Fidaxo is superior to Vanco, why should you use Vanco? Um, I, I would say you should not be using Vanco, but the cost of Fidaxomycin is such that it's very hard to justify using it for people at low risk of recurrence. But that does not mean that you should not be using it for people at high risk of recurrence. Now you can ask me who is at high risk of recurrence and we can have this debate. You can characterize them in many different ways, but I think that it is cost effective to use Fidaxo. I think that if, it's, if it was your mom, you would use Fidaxo every time. And I think that, um, I think that uh, you know, um, we are practicing a lot of antibiotic stewardship around the country. Antibiotics make a big, uh, big part of the pharmacy budget uh, in hospitals. Uh, and I think that people are sometimes trying to reduce costs um, in a way that shouldn't be practiced. I would also say, as someone who worked on Fidaxo and is signed on the New England Journal paper on Fidaxo, that I was very irritated when I saw the cost that it came with because I thought that it is really naturally positioned to become first line for CDF and everyone will use that. But the company said, look at what happens with all those antibiotics that are being produced. No one is using them. They're not going to use fidaxomycin. So we must make it expensive because otherwise, you know, we're not going to recover any of our. So, and, 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 and that's the way it works. Thank you very much. I think we're over time. So thank you. Thank you.